Hi there everyone, you don't normally see me this side of the lens in 60 Symbols videos, but today not only are you going to see my face, you're going to see the inside of my brain, thanks to some technology being worked on by Professor Matt Brooks and his team inside the Sir Peter Mansfield Imaging Centre there. Before we look at the new technology though, we're going to show you some older technology. Shall we go and have a look? Yep. Let's do it. Here we go. Sir Peter Mansfield, the late Sir Peter Mansfield, won the Nobel Prize for his work on MRI. And there are some great MRI scanners in here. It makes a cool noise if you want to uh, press the button and pull. Nice. This is not an MRI, this is a MEG scanner. Matt, what is a MEG scanner? With most scanners, including MRI, what we usually look at is brain structure. So what, what the brain looks like. And that's, that's brilliant if you've got you know, a tumour or a growth, a structural abnormality. But actually in a lot of dis disorders, um, it's not the structure of the brain that goes wrong, it's the function. It's what th the networks of neurons are doing. So a MEG scanner measures not brain structure, but brain function. So like an MRI is like you're imaging the city and the MEG is imaging all the cars and people exactly. walking around. Exactly. Right. That's exactly what's going on. When your brain's active, the neurons, the cells, send little electrical currents to one another. Those electrical currents make magnetic fields which pass through our skull and outside our head. So our brains are effectively trying to tell us a little bit about what they're doing if we can measure those tiny little magnetic fields. In this helmet, there are 275 very, very sensitive magnetic field detectors. They measure the distribution of magnetic fields moment to moment around your head. So when, when, when your brain starts doing something, if we ask you to do a task, we see these currents flying along neurons, we get changing magnetic fields and in that way we can infer your brain activity. So if Matt very briefly lets me sit in here, we will show you one of the downfalls of the MEG scanner, which will lead us to what Matt himself has been working on. There we go. How's that? That's not a bad fit. I've actually got a really big head. I struggle with hats normally, <laughs> but I am getting in all right. Go okay, on. this is the world's worst adrenaline ride. So you slowly go up. Oh yeah, okay. This feels like you could like a James Bond torture device. <laughs> yeah. All right. How's that? Can you feel the top of your yes, head touching? Yes, the, t the, the scan is now hitting the top of my head. Yep. Okay, do you want to come down a little bit? Or no, is no, that, no, it's, is that it's comfortable? good. It's comfortable. So the problem with conventional MEG is um, we would scan you for 20 minutes, maybe half an hour, maybe even longer, um, but you can't move your head more than five millimetres. Second problem, you mentioned you've got quite, quite a big head, so your head is probably filling the yes. helmet. Okay. So that mean, that's really good because it means your brain is as bad as close to the sensors, which are behind the plastic, as, as you can get. Mm -hmm. But if you were going to scan like a, a one-year-old, a two-year-old or a baby, their heads are much smaller, mm. so their brains are much further away from the sensors. So the system is effectively one size fits all. We, we're scanning you, but we'd have to use the same system to scan a baby, and we, we just can't pick up enough, enough signal to actually measure anything useful in kids. And also, Matt, typically when someone's being scanned with one of these MEG scanners, do the people do you want the person to be doing something like writing? Or? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so remember, it's measuring brain function. So we need to evoke brain function. If you're standing, sit, sitting really still, there's a limited amount we can get you to do. You know, for instance, you can't go for a walk. You can't behave naturally. You can't do handwriting because you need to move your head to be able to do that kind of thing. So the the technology is massively restrictive on the tasks that we can get you to do, and therefore, you know, it's, it's very restrictive on the brain function that we can evoke. These limitations of Meg is what you're all about and what we're going to go and have a look at. Exactly, yeah. All right, well, let's go upstairs and have a look at what you've been doing. Okay, let me get you out. <laughs> all right, so now we've come into Matt's lab. I'm very excited about what's behind this door and having my brain scanned, but before we do that, Matt, can you show us some of the stuff you've got here in this room and tell us what you've been trying to achieve and how you've been trying to do it? Yeah, so um, the, the system that we just looked at, the really big system, um, the problem with that is to detect the tiny little magnetic fields that are coming from your brain, the sensors need to be cooled to liquid helium temperatures, so four degrees Kelvin. What we've been doing here is using new types of sensor. That's an optically pumped magnetometer or an OPM, and that measures the same fields as the superconducting sensors with the same sensitivity, but it doesn't require the liquid helium. So we can just put one of those on your head. The cool things about that is because we just put it on your head, your head can move and the sensor moves with your head. 
So you can move during a scan and, it, and, it, and it, it doesn't really matter. The other thing we can do is we can just mount them in a helmet. So you can see behind you here some of the original helmets. So that, that was the first one we had where we were only scanning part of the brain and the sensors were a lot bigger. And then we went to try and do whole brain. And then we moved to these smaller, like Lego brick size sensors. This is the sort of helmet that we're using at the minute. So you'd fill all these holes with these OPMs? Yeah, that's right. How well can you explain to me how an OPM works? <laughs> how does it detect these tiny magnetic fluctuations? Inside here, there's a small glass cell which had a, a bunch of rubidium atoms in it. Now, those atoms have spin, so they behave like tiny little magnets. When we talk to those atoms with a laser, what that does is it takes all of those little magnetic moments, all of those little magnets, and it makes them point in the same direction. So that means the atoms, the atomic gas, becomes magnetic. Then when it sees an external magnetic field, like we put this on my head and it sees the field from my brain, all of those aligned atomic magnetic moments suddenly start deflecting, just like a compass deflects to point north in the Earth's magnetic field. And by looking at the amount of laser light that actually gets through these atoms, we can tell how much they're deflecting, and then we can measure how big the magnetic field is from my brain. Ah, oh, that is a big door. Why do you need such a big door? So this is magnetic shielding. Right. So um, the, again, it comes down to the fact that the magnetic fields from your brain are tiny. The fields all around us, from cars moving around to you know, cameras to computers, are much bigger than the fields that we're trying to detect. Mm. So we need to screen them out, and that's why there's all this um, magnetic screening. Okay, we're in the room now. I can see no, no liquid helium device in here. Yeah. What is in here? Tell me about some of the things around us. One of the problems is everywhere around us is the Earth's magnetic field. Even in this big shielded room, there's still a remnant Earth's magnetic field. A tiny magnetic field, but it's still too big that if you move your head um, in that field, we will be able to see it on the sensors and it might stop the sensors working. I think you're underestimating the power <laughs> of my brain here, but all right. So these are electromagnetic coils and these things here are detectors. So what we do is we detect that remnant Earth's magnetic field with this reference array and then we feed back to the coils so that the coils cancel that magnetic field to zero. So the Earth's magnetic field is in here, but this is kind of like creating a negative Earth's magnetic field. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you add the two together and it cancels out to zero. And this is where you're going to have this, me this sitting? This is where you're going to be sitting, yeah. This is very familiar to what you showed me before, but now yeah. we can see all these OPMs. It's yeah. filled with OPMs. I didn't think of it at the time, but of course all these OPMs have to be connected by cables. Look That's that. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cable management is something that we're working on. Okay. So the experiment we're going to be doing today um, you're going to be handwriting, mm -hmm. so you're going to be moving your hand in a specific, very well-practiced way. So the parts of your brain that we're focusing on is called the motor cortex. Your right hand is controlled by the left side, your left hand is controlled by the right side. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to make you write with your right hand, then we're going to make you write with your left hand, and we're going to, we're going to look at the differences between the two. So we just put this on your head. Okay, yep. How's that feel? Good. You feel yep. okay? Yep. Just tuck my ears in. Yeah. <laughs> And then this reference array comes now behind you. This reference array is going to measure the background magnetic field. Um, and that will then feed back to these coils to put his head in a zero field environment in which we can then measure the tiny magnetic fields from his brain. All right. And you need a pencil. I need a pencil. Thank you. We're going to do two experiments. Each will be about five minutes long. In the first experiment, um, we want you to just see the words and write them down. Okay. So, so all I'll you've got to do is write to that. write that word. So it's going to happen 30 times. Write each word. And each time, all you've got to do is, is write, write okay. the words. Okay. And, then, and then we do the fun one, yeah. where you've got to do it again, but um, with your left hand. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, we're ready to start. Are you, are you happy? Yes, I am. Okay, we'll start now. Okay. So over here on the right hand screen we've got the um, OPM control each line is a different sensor on his head and that's controlling each of those sensors and then what we're looking at here each little trace is the magnetic fields that are being generated by his brain as he undertakes a task Okay, that's all done. So we'll just reset up to, to go again with your left hand this time. Okay. Right, 
Okay, are you ready to start? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, starting now. So he's kind of looking down to write the word here and then back up as he's finished. Is he left-handed now? He's left-handed now. That should make things more hard. <laughs> quite hard with your left hand, isn't it? Very. <laughs> <laughs> so how was it? Do you know what? Quite warm. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a bit like having an electric blanket on your head on about one and a half. So what happens is the, each OPM has to be slightly heated to um, put the, the atoms into a specific regime called the spin exchange yeah. relaxation free regime. This movement of the, um, of, of the atomic magnetic moments that we see when, when your brain starts firing, when we see those magnetic fields, that, that we can't measure it unless they're heated. Yeah, well, um, there's 44 lasers on my head. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So do you want to come and see your brain? Yes, I do, I do. Your it brain was, function. It was really interesting. When I was doing it right-handed, because it's quite an easy yeah. task, yeah, yeah. I got quite bored. Yeah, yeah, And yeah, my yeah, mind yeah, yeah. started yeah. wandering. And then yeah. I was thinking, oh no, is my wandering mind going to ruin the test? Of... <laughs> Admittedly, when it was left-handed, I mean, look at, look at my right hand. <laughs> look at my right hand versus my left hand. <laughs> So when I was left-handed, it was pretty intensive. But then I started like second-guessing you because there were words like peace and knife and blood. And I thought, oh, are they testing my reactions to, <laughs> to like emotive words? And I'd, I'd started thinking, is this some double test that he's doing? And no, no. All we were doing there was literally the mechanics of moving your hand. And we're trying, trying to look at the, the, the motor system and how that works. But you could imagine there's lots more bits of your brain that are firing other than your motor system. So like your language cortex. So each of those is a word. So you will have reacted to each word in, in, a, in a different way. But what happens if there's, if we say, gave you words and then non-words, so just a random collection of letters. So in, in a word, it, it evokes something, where, mm. where, whereas in a random collection of letters, you just write it down. So that's where we're going with this. But, but right now, it, it really is a test of the scanner more than your, your brain. So does the scanner work rather than what, what, what are you thinking? So what we're really looking at is that big blue bit there. So they're called neural oscillations. So your electrical brain activity is dominated by rhythms. So there's a really famous one called the alpha rhythm. What we're looking at is a slightly higher frequency one called the beta rhythm. So what happens is when your brain's not doing anything, it's like idling almost, like a car just ticking over. All of the bits of your, of your motor cortex, all of the bits that are in your motor network, are just talking to each other. They're just saying, hey, I'm still here, blah, blah, blah. And so you, you get these oscillations. But then all of a sudden when you try and try do your handwriting task, that region of your brain, you, you, you'll say, well, I need you to go and actually do this motor output. So, it's a, uh, so that's, that region suddenly drops out of the network. And so these, these oscillations, these beta oscillations that maintain these, this network suddenly switch off as that region goes and does its thing and allows you to move your hand. So, so we're looking at those beta oscillations switch off to allow your hand to move. So in some ways you're looking at what's not happening as much as what is happening. Exactly, yeah. So this is your head from the front, and this is when you're using your right hand. This is the part of your brain that was lighting up. Now it's not precise because what we're doing is mapping this to a template brain, not your actual brain, so it's not absolutely precise. But you can see there's a big chunk of your brain that's firing. That's the part of your brain that's controlling your right hand when you're writing. These are all the sensors around the outside, so that's where the sensors were. And then this is the brain and the part of the brain that was firing up. So these are the current in your brain that were generating those magnetic fields that were being picked up by the sensors. Was this part of my brain really that dormant or? It was to the task, yeah. So if you think about it, you know, you're just moving your hand. It doesn't take your whole brain to, hmm. to, to write a word. But when I was in there, I was also thinking like, oh, is James filming this? And what are they yeah. talking about? And how is this video going to work? And I would have thought all the parts of my brain were that, going crazy. They would have been. But if you think about it, we got you to write 30 words. You were writing and then you weren't writing. writing, and then, you weren't. And then we average over those 30 things. So this is an average of me over the 30 words. Exactly. It's not yeah, just yeah, one, yeah. a snapshot of one. That's right, right yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. What you kind of think is, okay, when he was writing with his left hand, it's going to be hmm. the opposite side. Hmm. Um, you know, left, left brain controls right hand and right brain controls left hand. 
actually that's not what's going on. So this is what was going on when you were using your left hand and this is pretty typical. So you think, okay, it's just gonna be this bit around here, but actually it's not it's both sides. This is effectively your motor network saying, I really don't like doing this. No, my handwriting show that. So, <laughs> so that side is still like the, where most of the action's happening. Yeah. That one's quite a bit less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So here's when, here's when you did it, Matt. So the difference between mine and yours is I already had an underlying MRI scan. Okay, so what we can do is we can then superimpose all of this activity. Remember, we're measuring the function, but we can superimpose that over the structure. So th this red blob here, was when I was writing with my right hand. So you can see exactly the same as you, it's on the left hand side of my brain. And so that's right-handed handwriting. And then the blue blobs that we can see are when I was writing with my left hand. And, and you can see exactly the same as in you, you get this bilateral response. You think it should just be a big blue blob over here, but actually that's not what goes on because it's really hard to write with your, with your left hand. What's the future for this technology? Why is this important? Why should I be excited about it? In the very short term, so this is where we do all the physics, so this is our, our development lab, but we have a mirror image of this system at, um, at a place called Young Epilepsy, which is um, affiliated with Great Ormond Street Hospital. It's where lots of children with really, really severe epilepsy go. In the same way that we tracked the area of your brain that was controlling your hand, we can find the areas of the brain that, that are associated with, with epileptic seizures. And that's really useful information for neurosurgeons. You can bring a child into a, into a room like this, you put the helmet on, you, you scan them for 20 minutes, they go off and they, I don't know, go for a, a cup of tea or whatever, and then they, they, they come back again and you can scan them for 20 minutes again. All you've got to do is to keep putting the helmet on and taking it off again. In perhaps the medium term, uh, you've probably seen all of the, the headlines about concussion in sport and things like that, and the military, it's a big problem in the military. Um, so when we use this system in people who have had a concussion, um, we tend to see elevated, very low frequency activity. And that's a proposed biomarker of concussion, which just doesn't exist at the minute. So again, that, that's, that's another, if you like, clinical angle. And then we can take it further and we talk about mental health, depression, things, really severe mental health problems like schizophrenia. Um, so there are biomarkers of that. So actually the, the thing that we're going to be looking at in your brain or the thing that we've measured in your brain is we know is abnormal in schizophrenia. So, um, so we can start to get biomarkers of these really until now poorly understood and poorly characterizable mental health conditions. What we are doing a lot of work on is, is making these rooms lighter and much easier to install and cheaper as well. One final question. Yeah. Why is it purple? <laughs> <laughs> different colours for different size heads. So oh. this is the biggest helmet we have. Okay. There's, there's another one over there which is bright blue and that's for two year olds. We didn't want something that would look clinical. We wanted something that a child might actually like to wear. And kids like bright colours. So, so that, that's why we went for the bright colours. I'm not quite sure why it was purple for adults and blue for two-year-olds and uh, I think there's an orange one, but, um, but yeah. There you go. The charge is moving, so this is a very hand-waving hand -waving description of what's going on, but a moving charge corresponds to an electric current. The noise is very loud, yeah. but it's, it stops very suddenly. 